Okay, good afternoon, everybody. So uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Hassan Salem today from the Max Planck Institute for Biology in Tübingen. So uh, Hassan today is giving the IGC Friday seminar, but he's also giving a, a SIMBNET online seminar, part of the series that we've been uh, 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 producing. And he's also here because he's been teaching the PhD students, IGC PhD students in the host microbe interactions course. And on top of that, uh, this seminar is also part of the program of the CoLife postdoc day. So this is a, he has a quadruple function today, and we're extracting mass, maximum value from his trip here. Thank you very much. So Hassan um, did his PhD in, uh, in the Max Planck in, uh, um, in Jena with uh, Martin Kalkerpot, and then he did a, a postdoc with uh, Nicole Gerardo in uh, Emory University. Then he, had, he was for sh a short time in the uh, uh, Institute of Advanced Studies in Berlin, and then move on to be a fellow uh, in the Natural History Museum uh, in Smith, 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 uh, Smithsonian Natural History Museum. And then he started in 2020 his, his lab in the Max Planck Institute uh, in Germany. So throughout all of this time, he's been working on uh, 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 insect microbe interactions, and uh, he belongs to a, a small group of people that can look at uh, insects in the wild, see which microbes they carry, and uh, almost by magic figure out what's happening in their interaction. And uh, today he's going to speak about uh, these kind of interactions with beetles and microbes. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Louis, for the introduction and the invitation. All right, so uh, I work in my lab is mostly concentrated on the evolution of neutralisms or symbioses. And uh, we tend to focus most of our efforts on the uh, symbioses of beetles with uh, microorganisms. Uh, and we ask questions about how do symbioses facilitate adaptation in beetles. Uh, beetles are a great group of animals to ask these questions uh, because of, so there's a hand back there. How about this? How about this? Better? How about this? All right, great. So we'll pretend it's open, uh, open mic night. Okay, so we focus primarily on beetles and uh, we ask how symbionts facilitate adaptation in beetles. And of course, one of the first things you know about beetles uh, from high school or college is that they're exceptionally diverse. And corresponding to that diversity are the range of symbioses that they also engage in. Uh, they vary quite a bit in both form and function. So for the purpose of my talk today, I'm going to start with uh, the role microbes play in facilitating herbivory. And the reason why we focus on herbivory as an initial question in the lab is that herbivory is a dominant characteristic in beetles. Uh, one in two beetles is obligately herbivorous. So it's a dominant characteristic of just being a beetle. Uh, but, my, but plants, of course, are not the easiest source of nutrition. Uh, they're composed of recalcitrant uh, polysaccharides that are really hard to digest. Sometimes they're packed with secondary metabolites that are quite toxic for herbivores. And depending on which part of the plant you feed on, uh, you may be exposed and adapting or trying to adapt to a nutritionally imbalanced diet. And so my lab is primarily interested in the role microbes play in bridging that metabolic gap. Uh, and uh, the model that we use towards answering these questions is the uh, tortoise leaf beetle model. And this is a subfamily of, of herbivorous beetles that belong to the Cassidini. Uh, Cassidines or tortoise beetles are charismatic for a variety of reasons, uh, but we find them to be very compelling from a microbial ecology standpoint because of the simplicity of their microbiome. This one particular beetle, Casta rubiginosa, it's a European beetle that has radiated uh, in a cosmopolitan way, in the sense that you could find it in Japan, you could find it in New Zealand, you could find it in the States. And uh, when you look at the microbial associates of Casta rubiginosa, you find that up to 80% of its overall, um, um, so its, uh, OTU count or ASV count is just a single strain of gamma proteobacteria. And the phylogenetic position of that symbiont is quite interesting. So it falls within the so-called symbiotic clade within gamma proteobacteria, which is to say that it's a close phylogenetic relative to primary endosymbionts like Wigglesworthia, 
uh, the primary endosymbiont that supplements B vitamins and tsetse flies. It's a close relative to the primary endosymbiont of aphids, uh, Buchnera, which supplements essential amino acids. And so the first time that we characterized uh, at the molecular level this symbiosis, when we saw the phylogeny, uh, we, we guessed that we might be on the right track in characterizing a mutualism just by virtue of the association of this microbe relative to other primary endosymbionts. So uh, this, this uh, symbiosis that I'm going to start my talk with, uh, it features one, please. So is the global distribution something that we did to them or is that, is that a, a, a biologically relevant global globality? Uh, it is absolutely our fault. <laughs> So uh, this, uh, this Cassida rubiginosa, this beetle, uh, has been, it's introduced to New Zealand, for example, a place where it uh, had no business being, uh, because it's also used as a biocontrol agent for a bunch of thistle plants. And so in a lot of ways, um, Cassida rubiginosa accidentally and, adverted, and intentionally has been uh, introduced to a bunch of different regions. So uh, for um, the portion of this talk, I'm going to uh, talk about this primary endosymbiont in tortoise beetles. And uh, this symbiont is called uh, Stamera caplata. Stamera to reflect the work of, um, an early work of a German scientist who described the morphology of the symbiosis uh, about 80, 80 years ago that we've picked up on uh, in the last five years. And caplata to reflect adaptations uh, in the insect side to vertically transmit the symbionts. So where do you find uh, Stamera caplata within its beetle host? What you're looking at here is a continuous dissection of all the internal organs of a tortoise beetle, starting with the foregut, midgut, hindgut, and ovaries. And contrasting the DAPI counterstain with a probe targeting Stamera or the primary symbiont in green, you find that the symbiont is localized in two main areas. Um, in these symbiotic organs uh, at the junction between the foregut and midgut, as well as these accessory glands here uh, associated with the ovaries, and these are relevant for, for symbiont transmission. So let's take a look at the, um, the structure of these symbiotic organs. A few things stand out. The first is that these symbiotic organs, uh, they're very similar to other symbiotic organs you find in other insects, but they vary in the sense that there are no bacteriocytes. There are no specialized host cells that Stamera lives in. Rather, Stamera occurs within an extracellular matrix which is to say that it's, a, it's not an intracellular microbe, it's an extracellular one. And this is super relevant when we consider symbiont function in just a few slides, but also the evolution, uh, the molecular evolution of symbionts. And the other thing I'd like to highlight here is that these symbiotic organs are connected to that foregut midgut junction via very thin tubules, again, relevant for, for symbiont function. Uh, if we take a look closer look at these uh, organs associated with the ovaries, um, the same pattern holds. Stamera is extracellularly localized and becomes partitioned uh, as it exits these accessory glands towards the ovaries. And what you see here is that the, uh, there are um, sphere-like structures uh, that are um, building up in the ovaries, uh, especially when this beetle is about to lay eggs. And this is extremely relevant when we consider the vertical propagation of Stamera from one generation to the next. Uh, my lab cares quite a bit about symbiont transmission uh, just because uh, it's really the first step towards manipulating and dissecting a symbiosis. Uh, and uh, transmission in the system is, is quite unique relative to other beetle systems um, in the sense that when egg clutches are laid, each individual egg is deposited with a single applet at the anterior pole. And if we take a closer look at uh, these caplets, you find that they're, they're populated with sphere-like structures. So whether we consider here 3D reconstruction of the structure of the caplet, uh, and if you impose these sections and perform fluorescence and pseudo-hybridization, you find that these um, caplets are filled with uh, spheres, and these spheres are composed almost entirely of stamera. And so the idea here is that uh, as the developing embryo uh, it closes and becomes a, a larva, it climbs out of uh, the anterior pole of the egg consumes the spheres and initiates the uh, interaction with Stamera. And so getting at the mutualistic role of Stamera for its host, so far we've described it as a symbiosis. We don't really know if it's beneficial or not yet for its host. Uh, in getting at that question of whether it's mutualistic, we uh, generated aposymbiotic beetles without using antibiotics, rather by just simply removing uh, the caplet from the anterior pole of each egg. And in generating aposymbiotic individuals, we um, looked at the survivorship of these of the closing larvae, 
and compare them to the symbiotic group. And as you can see here, there's a drastic uh, impact to, to aposymbiosis. Symbiote loss uh, corresponds to 0% um, of larvae becoming adults. Uh, and so Stamara here is, is um, quite an obligate symbiont for tortoise beetles. But what is it doing? Uh, one approach that we took towards understanding symbiont role is by sequencing the genome of the symbiont. And uh, what came back was uh, an unusually small genome. So uh, this genome clocked in at 270,000 base pairs. Uh, it's small, but it's not by any means the smallest uh, symbiont genome out there. But it is the smallest genome when you consider the localization of this microbe. So if you plot representative bacterial genomes according to where they live, so if you um, have uh, microbes that are extracellular, shown here in gray, and plot them against uh, intracellular microbes shown here in black according to their genome size and genome co or GC content, you got a really nice separation. And uh, at the um, outline of that, that distribution was this um, microbe, Mycoplasma genitalium, the poster microbe for the minimal genome concept. Uh, basically, the um, uh, minimal number of genes that you need to live outside of a host cell. Uh, Stamara doesn't have uh, just a little bit or fewer genes than Mycoplasma genitalium. Uh, it encodes half of these genes. So half of the genes that were previously characterized as necessary for a minimal life outside of a host cell are annotated in this symbiont. But what is it doing? So um, what, is, what is encoded in this, in this genome that uh, reflects the nutritional ecology of its beetle host? Uh, in addition to genes involved in uh, replication, transcription, translation, we were able to annotate two classes of pectinases. Pectin, of course, is a huge component of the primary cell wall of a plant. And if you're a herbivorous uh, beetle, especially a folivorous beetle, which is to say that you live on leaves primarily, you need to be able to access the nutritionally rich cytosol of plant cells. Uh, and to do so, you need plant cell wall degrading enzymes. Stamara brings two of them into the system. And so more about these enzymes. Uh, the first is polygolicturinase, belonging to the GH family 28. Uh, it allows um, uh, uh, the beetle to deconstruct the homopolymer of pectin. And ramgolicturinolyase, a secondary pectinase that allows the beetle to deconstruct the uh, heteropolymer of pectin. Okay, but uh, does symbiote loss correspond to a diminished pectinolytic activity? Uh, what you're seeing here is an auger diffusion assay. Uh, halos are indicative of activity. Diminished halos are indicative of diminished pectinolytic activity. And what you can see here is that symbiont loss consistently, whether you're considering the homopolymer of pectin or the heteropolymer of pectin, uh, aposymbiosis corresponds to an inability to, to deconstruct this polysaccharide. And so a follow-up question here is, um, why so minimal? How did, how did Stammer evolve such a small uh, genome and a limited metabolism? And one approach that we took to answering that question is by looking at how the symbiont produces and generates energy. Uh, when you consider reductive genome evolution in bacteria, uh, especially when you think about them relative to insect symbioses, um, you still see a high degree of conservation um, when it comes to the uh, glycolysis and citric acid cycle. Uh, here we're comparing two uh, genomes of different sizes, E. coli as a free living microbe and Buchnera as, a, as an insect associated symbiont. And even though Buchnera went through reductive genome evolution, it still maintains this glycolysis citric acid cycle combination. This is thought to be adaptive because uh, Buchnera is a, is a symbiont that produces amino acids for its host. And many of the derivatives, uh, and sorry, the precursors for amino acid production are encoded through this glycolysis citric acid combination. But Stamara, of course, is not a symbiont that produces or earns its keep through amino acid production. It's a symbiont that um, the entire relationship is predicated on pectin degradation. And what we observe here is that um, Stammer evolved an obligate fermentation pathway, which is to say that it generates reducing equivalents to the transformation of glucose to pyruvate, then the, the fermentation of pyruvate to lactate through the activity of lactate dehydrogenase. Follow-up question was then, how conserved is this association in both um, at a metabolic level as well as a genomic uh, level? And uh, in addressing that question, we traveled around the world collecting cassidines. And so, so far, most of this work that I've been showing you features this uh, European tortoise beetle, Cassida Uh But cassidines are exceptionally diverse. There are roughly 5,000 species of cassidines. Uh, it's almost as many uh, species as mammals. Uh, and so we wanted to understand, uh, given that diversity, how, how conserved is the symbiosis? And uh, we focus most of our collection, initial collection efforts in Central and South America. That's where uh, tortoise beetles are predicted to have originated. 
but it's also certainly where they've undergone the greatest rates of diversification. If we wanted to learn something about the origin and evolution of the symbiosis, we needed to go to Central and South America and spend a lot of time there. Uh, okay, so what came back was that uh, regardless of where you collect your symbiont, uh, the symbiont has a structurally conserved genome. And the size of that genome ranges between 200 and 300,000 base pairs. And matching that high degree of structural conservation is a high degree of metabolic conservation. The symbiont is good at roughly the same things. Uh, and what we find here is that, again, informational processing genes are highly represented in this uh, reduced genome, uh, as well as genes involved in protein modification and the carbohydrate metabolism. This is a microbe that burns its teeth through the production of pectinases that function in the carbohydrate metabolism of the toast. Given that high degree of metabolic conservation, we wondered whether we'd see variation in host beneficial factors. Uh, and what I mean by that are the pectinases uh, or the digestive enzymes that are brought into the system through stomera. I've introduced you to polyglucturinase and ramglucturin lyase, one that functions against the homopolymer of pectin, the other against the heteropolymer of pectin. And uh, what we found was that there actually is variation in what the symbiont encodes. Um, the first is that polyglucturinase is elemental to the symbiosis. It's in every stomera strain that we collected uh, in 2020. Uh, but round electron lyase, uh, that varies. Not every single stomera strain uh, encodes it and supplements it to its host. And so a follow-up question was, how does that variation affect the digestive physiology of the beetle host? And we took these two representative lineages of beetles, Passagera vaginosa and Chidiomorpha ultramens. Once one of them derives two classes of pectinases, the other a single class. And we looked at how these beetles are able to deconstruct different uh, plant polysaccharides. And what we found was that in the homo, when we considered the homopolymer of pectin, both have a symbiont that supplements polyglycturinase. And as a result, we find that uh, both beetles are able to monomerize the homopolymer of pectin. That makes sense. When it comes to the heteropolymer of pectin, only Cassiter rubiginosa, that green beetle that has a symbiont that supplements rongolocturin lines, only that species is able to deconstruct it into its most basic subunits compared to uh, a dimer that, um, that builds up in, in Chidiomorpha alternates. So that variation at the genetic level in the symbiont correlates to variation at the physiology uh, level of, of the beetle. And so a follow-up to that was that we wanted to understand how that variation in the digestive physiology of the beetle, how does that affect the ecology of the beetle? And uh, what we found was that beetles that are supplemented with one class of pectinases, uh, in this case, polyglycturinase, these co-evolved with a narrow range of host plants compared to beetles that are supplemented with two classes of pectinases. Uh, these co-evolve with horning glories, they co-evolve with uh, thistles, and they co-evolve with cherry and apple trees. So there's a, um, a, a, a correlation between the symbiont metabolic range and the ecological breadth of the beetle host. But like I just mentioned, this is uh, largely correlational. And um, one of the major questions in my lab is, to, is whether this um, variation in symbiont metabolic factors is causal to the ecological radiation of tortoise beetles. And uh, the work uh, that I'll talk about right now is primarily by uh, Ines Ponce, a Humboldt postdoctoral researcher in, in my group. And Ines is um, interested in um, uh, testing whether uh, these two classes of pectinases uh, affect host plant use differently compared to beetles that are supplemented with just polyglycturinase. And she's capitalizing on two aspects of the system. The fact that you could generate some free individuals without using antibiotics. And the other is that the symbiont is transmitted vertically through a caplet. Uh, and the idea is that she wanted to exchange these caplets, introduce a symbiont into a new host, and see how that new host approaches its host plants. Before doing so, Ines wanted to learn something um, or more about the, uh, the symbiont bearing uh, vehicles, these caplets. And um, as, as a result, she wanted to focus on uh, the structure um, of, of these capitalists. We, we had a rough idea of what's inside, but, but not fully. And what Ines found was that the symbiont bearing spheres are separated from the developing embryo in the chorion through a very thin membrane. Uh, we had seen parts of it, but not all of it when we initially described the symbiosis five years ago. And uh, the other thing that Ines discovered was that the number of spheres packaged within each caplet is tightly controlled. And what I mean by that is that there are roughly 12 spheres within each caplet, plus minus two spheres, which tells us there's a high degree of maternal control over what's allocated uh, every generation to uh, the offspring. 
So a closer look at this membrane, uh, because it posed as a potential challenge, uh, it wasn't clear to us exactly how the symbiont transverses from the caplet to the developing embryo when there's something that completely separates them. Um, and so the timing of symbiont acquisition was still an open question for us in the lab. And so Ines uh, designed a, um, so she followed up by asking, when is Stammer acquired by its beetle host? And in addressing that question, um, she uh, followed the structural integrity of this membrane. And she found that seven days after opposition, this membrane is intact. Nine days, still intact. But one day prior to eclosion, so 10 days after albic positioning, you see that that membrane is pierced, suggesting that acquisition of Stamara precedes eclosion and precedes the emergence of larvae from the egg. And so in order to test that question, uh, she designed um, an experiment where she compared her symbiotic and aposymbiotic treatments to two other experimental treatments. One where she removes the caplet and puts it immediately outside of the egg, requiring the larva to essentially leave the egg to go get it, go get the symbiont. Uh, and then she had another group where she compared the infection frequencies when she reapplied the content, the spheres uh, of these caplets to the anterior pole of uh, an aposymbiotic egg, effectively telling us that access to the spheres while inside the egg is essential for Stamara acquisition. And the infection frequency of Stamara uh, was, was pretty clear. Uh, you basically had to have access to these spheres while developing in the chorion to initiate infection. Uh, those uh, larvae that had access to the caplet after hatching, they couldn't acquire the symbiont, suggesting that there's a strict developmental window for when the symbiont can be acquired and potentially colonizing the symbiotic organs. Then Ines wanted to follow through uh, by examining and characterizing the maternal investments that go into the vertical propagation of the symbiosis. And the reason why Ines asked that question is because she followed the symbiont titers throughout egg development and embryo development within the chorion. And what she found was that the symbiont population is pretty quite stable between day one and day 11, the number of days that are required from albi positioning to eclosion. Uh, but then uh, once these, um, uh, developing uh, when these larvae, they hatch and uh, they leave the egg, they discard their caplets and up to 50% of the symbiont population is discarded every single generation with that caplet, suggesting that there might be a high degree of overinvestment in the system. And the question here, of course, is why? Why are these symbionts being lost every single generation? And um, what is the minimal number of maternal investment that is just strictly necessary for the vertical transmission uh, by the beetle host? And in addressing that question, uh, Ines capitalized on her ability to deconstruct the contents of the spheres and individually allocate uh, individual spheres to, to each offspring. And what I'd like you to focus on is this um, spherical structure right here and uh, the behavioral response of the soon to be larvae to it. Uh, the sphere is when Ines deposits it at the anterior pole of a 10 day old uh, egg, uh, is recognized as a source of something. And that's something that's just immediately consumed uh, by the soon-to-be larvae. And that was really useful because Ines could then control the number of spheres that she could allocate to, towards individual offspring. She started off with a single sphere, three spheres, and a caplet content of spheres, which is 12. And what she could show is that initially, uh, there is variation in, in um, uh, how Stamara colonizes these symbiotic organs depending on the starting symbiote population. If only one sphere is allocated, uh, this corresponds to a lower titer compared to the control group. And the more symbionts you allocate six days after, or sorry, um, prior to, to eclosion, uh, the more symbionts you're going to have in the symbiotic organ and six day old larvae. But six days later, that effect is equalized. It's effectively, Stammerer catches up and fills that ecological niche within the beetle. And you find that there's no difference in symbiont titers across these four treatments. And matching that equalization, you find that there's no difference in survivorship across the different treatments, effectively telling us that one sphere is just as good at 12 spheres when it comes to the uh, initial question of uh, vertical transmission. But this is a symbiosis that is 80 million years ago, 80 million years old. Uh, it's very unlikely that there's uh, an overinvestment. And what I should say here is also these experiments were conducted in the comforts of our lab in Tübingen. Um, it's um, 
yes, you only need one symbiote sphere to initiate the symbiosis, but you probably need all other eleven spheres to make sure and mitigate the risk of accidental aposymbiosis. Uh, the turquoise beetle is very likely hedging its bets by overinvesting because the cost of accidental symbiote loss is so drastic that it's better to pay a little bit more to transmit your symbionts than uh, your offspring paying the price of losing the symbiont because of abiotic stresses. And so a follow-up experiment that we want to do is actually conduct this exact experiment, but under field conditions where there are more drastic fluctuations in temperature and humidity, potentially disrupting the symbiosis um, transmission. All right, so the follow-up uh, set of questions relate to uh, organ formation relative to symbiont present. Uh, and this is work primarily led by Miguel Anthony Gonzalez, a postdoctoral researcher in the lab. And Miguel was primarily interested in the formation of the symbiotic organs relative to uh, the holometabolist lifestyle of this beetle. Uh, and the first set of slides I'll show you relate to that transition from the egg stage to the larval stage. Uh, so the initial colonization of Stamara from the caplets. And what Miguel did was that he followed, uh, through the application of high-resolution microscopy, he followed the formation of the different organs within uh, the, the, um, the embryo and soon-to-be larvae. Uh, relative to the formation of the symbiotic organ and other components of the gut. And what you've seen here it looks like a larvae, but it's not. It's, uh, it's an embryo that's been yoked out of uh, the inside of, a, of an egg. So this is 72 hours prior to eclosion or prior to emergence from the egg. And what you could see here is that uh, the outlines of the foregut relative to the midgut, relative to, hind, to the hindgut, haven't taken shape yet. What has taken shape is this hollowing out of um, something that uh, is roughly where we expect a symbiotic organ to form. 24 hours later, uh, you find that these, this hollowing out uh, becomes partitioned into club-shaped shaped organs that resemble, start resembling the symbiotic organs that Stamara eventually colonizes. And then 24 hours later, so, 40, so 24 hours prior to eclosion, you find that Stamara uh, colonizes these symbiotic organs. Uh, and what's, what's quite um, uh, important to highlight is that this colonization uh, precedes eclosion. Uh, and this is important because uh, Stamara needs to function immediately in facilitating the herbivorous lifestyle of this beetle. I mean, it hatches and immediately starts consuming leaves. And what we notice is that as the, the larva gets bigger and bigger, the size of the symbiotic organ is largely conserved. And the symbiont titers within these symbiotic organs is somewhat stable at the larval stage. This data set told us uh, that there might be uh, a, a canalization when it comes to the formation of the symbiotic organ, which is to say that this organ seems to form regardless, of, or it, it predates, it forms before the symbiote enters uh, the beetle, suggesting that it's um, wired into the developmental cycle of the beetle. And so Miguel then wanted to ask whether um, symbiont acquisition has any effects on the formation of these symbiotic organs. And so he generated symbiotic versus aposymbiotic beetles and found that in aposymbiotic beetles, they still form uh, symbiotic organs, but these symbiotic organs look pretty sad. They look like a deflated balloon, but they still form. So then Miguel turned his attention to the adult stage and he focused primarily on adult females. And the reason why M Miguel was interested in adult females is because they have these two categories of symbiotic organs. Uh, four gut symbiotic organs that are relative to the fund that are important for the and mediating herbivory and polyvory in, in the beetle, as well as these accessory glands that are relevant when you consider symbiont transmission. And the reason Miguel was interested in this was because he was wondering whether uh, Stamara uh, is uh, colonizing these organs in an asynchronous manner. And the reason this was uh, relevant is because uh, these beetles start feeding immediately following metamorphosis, but they don't immediately start laying eggs. Uh, and so he looked at the symbiont population dynamics uh, across development, and we found that um, from day one through day 36, following metamorphosis, the symbiont population titers in the foregut symbiotic organ are pretty stable. And uh, that makes sense. Uh, they start feeding immediately after completing metamorphosis. Uh, but it's a different case when we consider the accessory glands that are relevant for symbiont transmission. Uh, these beetles take about 29 days to start laying their first batches of, of eggs. And as a result, you see that the symbiont population titers uh, go from uh, non-existent in day one, and they peak around day 36, effectively coinciding 
with when these uh, beetles are, are laying their eggs and need to be provisioning their symbionts from one generation to the next. And so circling back to the question of whether Shadamara is causal to the ecological radiation of tortoise leaf beetles, uh, and that's uh, circled back to uh, this experimental setup of uh, picking up symbionts and cross-infecting them across different species. And uh, she's doing uh, this at the moment, these experiments using five donor species of, of tortoise beetles that vary in what the symbionts encode and supplement. And she's introducing all of them into our model species in the lab, Kidiomorpha ultimans. Uh, the transfections work, uh, but they work depending on the genetic distance of the symbionts uh, relative to the native symbionts. Uh, and so the, the further apart uh, at the phylogenetic level, the harder it is for that symbiont to colonize a new tortoise leaf beetle host. The number of spheres in the different species is always 12? Or 12 plus or minus two? Oh, um, the number of spheres, that's a fantastic question. Um, I don't know. Uh, so they, the size of the caplet varies. Um, and as a result, what we could harvest out of a, an individual caplet, it varies significantly. But whether that variation manifests in more spheres versus just bigger spheres, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but what we do is that we try to equalize it based on the number of spheres that the recipient uh, beetle expects to have. And so typically, you could equalize it based on weight or something uh, along similar lines. Okay, so next we wanted to understand something about the origin and molecular evolution of the symbiosis. And this is work primarily led by Marlene Garcia Lozano, a graduate student in the lab. And uh, Marlene wanted to understand something about the acquisition of the symbiosis relative to two features of the Cassidini. First, she wanted to know whether a Cassidine exists in the absence of Stamara. Is, is it a feature of being a Cassidine beetle? And the second thing is, whether uh, symbiont acquisition predated the evolutionary transition of tortoise beetles from monocot feeding to eudicot feeding. Uh, that's an important transition that many herbivorous lineages went through as this new emerging um, uh, niche uh, started taking shape that they could co-diversify with. And uh, what she found was that uh, basal lineages of cassidines are not symbiotic, so they don't harbor stamera. So not every single cassidine has that symbiont. And I'm going to circle back to this, um, this basal lineage of, of cassidines that are non-symbiotic in just a few slides. Uh, she also noticed that there's strict coplatogenesis. The tree of the symbiont matches the phylogenetic tree of the host. Uh, and that reflects the vertical transmission, uh, the near strict vertical transmission of stamera in the system. But what Marlini did find was that symbiont acquisition um, predated the evolutionary transition of cassidines from monocot to eudicot feeding, uh, suggesting that the acquisition of stamera may have counted as a pre-adaptation for that jump to this new and emerging niche. Now that we have more genomes, about um, 58 genomes on the symbiont side, Marlene wanted to learn something about the uh, molecular evolution signatures uh, acting on the system. And what she found was that there are 128 genes that form the core genome of stamera. And the uh, ratio of non-synonymous to synonymous substitutions in uh, these core genes, they tell us that they're, the, the symbiont is experiencing relaxed um, uh, purifying selection. But when you consider the host beneficial factors, so these digestive enzymes that Stamara brings into the system, these genes are, are governed by strict purifying selection, reflecting the importance of these digestive enzymes for the host. And so, so far I've told you a little bit more of, about the um, uh, digestive symbionts that are encoded by Stamara. We had polyglopturinase and ramglopturinin lice. And it turns out that the more genomes that we acquired and characterized in the system, the greater the variety of plant cell wall degrading enzymes that started showing up. And so we found a third class of pectinases and two classes of xylanases, an alpha glucuronidase and an endomaninase. And so then Marlene wanted to get a clear view of the stepwise process by which these enzymes starting showing, started showing up into the system. And uh, she plotted uh, the distribution of these enzymes relative to the host phylogeny. And what she found was that polyglopturinase, this enzyme that uh, breaks down the homopolymer of pectin, is universally found. Uh, it's it's uh, a defining feature of the symbiosis. There is no stamera without, um, without polyglopturinase. Whereas the accessory uh, pectinases and xylanases, they reflect different radiations for the beetles. And so here, Marlene wanted to define the ancestral state of the symbiosis 
And this was really important for her because she wanted to circle back to these non-symbiotic lineages of, of cast events. She wanted to ask why, why go down this symbiotic route? And the ancestral state of the symbiosis appears to be in the form of a polyglucturinase combination with ramagluturin lyase and alpha glucuronidase. And this was really uh, helpful because we wanted to then fish for the uh, set of digestive enzymes that these basal cassidines here at uh, the base of this tree, how they get by with being herbivores. They still feed on leaves and these leaves still encode and, and are uh, filled with pectin and, and xylem. And what Marlene found was when she searched for and the polygolecturinase in the um, genome assembly of the uh, basal cassidines, she found that these lineages, they encode the gene, but they encode it endogenously. They don't need a symbiont. They could express their own polygolecturinase, which begs the question, why outsource such an important function to a symbiont? And Marlene and I think that the reason why you go down this symbiotic route, because there's enzymatic synergy that comes through symbiosis. In a non-symbiotic state, you derive polyglucturinase. In a symbiotic state, you get polyglucturinase, ramagluturinase, and alpha-glucuronidase. So there's a cost of the symbiosis. It's very expensive to maintain a symbiont, but maybe it's worth it when you get these extra enzymes that allow you to deconstruct these universal plant polysaccharides. Uh, at the moment, Marlene is looking at uh, defining um, the species richness versus host plant use of a symbiotic versus non-symbiotic condition. Uh, towards confirming whether symbiont acquisition had an adaptive uh, impact in the host. So now I want to transition to uh, other forms of symbioses within tortoise beetles. And this is work primarily led by Eileen uh, Birasategi, and uh, so a CMFI early career fellow in my lab, and uh, Noah Breitenbach, uh, a star research assistant who was one of our first uh, lab members from the University of Tübingen. And uh, Eileen and Noah were uh, very interested in a very specific aspect of the life cycle of tortoise beetles. Um, it's a whole metabolism insect, which is to say that it goes from being in an egg to being a larva and then uh, undergoing metamorphosis during the pupil stage and then it closing as an adult. But one aspect that is unique to Chidimorpha alternates, our model species, is that it's covered by this white conspicuous uh, furriness at the pupil stage. And it's a very, um, it's a very unique uh, phenotype for a pupa. Uh, pupa are usually uh, inconspicuous, they're hidden, they're uh, camouflaged relative to, to their environment, but this pupa really stands out. And we wondered why uh, that is. And one of the reasons um, we didn't really give it much thought was because other insects, like scale insects, they develop this white furriness, and this white furriness is just waxy secretions. Uh, that are on the outside to help these insects contend with, with abiotic challenges. Um, but once we started looking at the pupil stage with better microscopes, it became very clear to us that this waxy secretion is not really waxy nor a secretion. Uh, it was rather uh, a filamentous fungus. And um, it wasn't any filamentous fungus, it was a Fusarium oxysporum. And so uh, plant pathologists, when you say Fusarium oxysporum, they get very excited or scared depending on the host plant or the, the crop plant that they're working with. Uh, and what I mean by that is that this symbiont that we characterized uh, on the surfaces of pupa is a close phylogenetic relative to a lot of uh, specialized plant pathogens. So then we followed the population dynamics of Fusarium oxysporum. And what Eileen and Noah found was that the population dynamics of the symbiont uh, are, are quite striking in the sense that they, the symbiont uh, explodes in, in density within the first 24 hours uh, following metamorphosis. And then the symbiont population is, is pretty stable um, during, um, during metamorphosis and during the entire pupil period. It tells us two things. It first tells us that, um, that the host has some control over uh, how the symbiont proliferates because it goes through a thousand fold increase within 24 hours. And whatever function that the symbiont is providing is necessary very early on uh, during pupation and is necessary throughout metamorphosis. But the question is, what is it doing? What is cerium uh, helpful for? And in characterizing the mutualistic role of Cerium oxysporum, we uh, again fell back to generating symbiont free individuals. And we could generate symbiont free individuals by topically applying um, a benzimidazole, which is a fungicide that is very effective against Fusarium. And uh, the application of benzimidazole topically generates effectively symbiont free uh, pupa. Uh, and this was really helpful because then we could ask whether this affects the eclosion of the beetle host. 
this is a, um, a antibiotic that functions against eukaryotic microbes. And it's not out of the realm of possibilities that it could also have a negative effect on the beetle. And what we found here was that uh, regardless of uh, benzamidazole presence absence, uh, these beetles complete uh, metamorphosis uh, at a normal rate, and they close at very similar rates and become adults. Um, so it was clear to us that the fungicide wasn't very harmful for the beetle. And secondarily, there wasn't a nutritional role that was, a, was um, uh, that the fungus was fulfilling towards the beetle during pupation. Uh, and so we hypothesized potentially that the symbiont is defensive, also given the localization of the microbe as an ectosymbiont. And uh, I should mention that a lot of these uh, preliminary experiments were done in the comforts of our lab in Tübingen. But this species of uh, tortoise beetles, it came to us originally from Panama. And so any antagonistic threats that we wanted to test this defensive symbiosis against required us to go back to where this uh, beetle lives. And so the lab packed its bags uh, back in November and uh, head to the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama across different locations and in collaboration with Donald Windsor. Uh, and we set up this uh, really basic experiment where we uh, generated symbiotic versus aposymbiotic pupa. And we wanted to see the survivorship of these insects in uh, under field conditions. And what we found was that if you keep these two treatments in sealed cages, so cages that are um, exposed to air and, and abiotic factors, but uh, removed from predators and, and um, uh, uh, parasitoids, uh, there was 100% survivorship across four days of occupation. Uh, the variation between an aposymbiotic and a symbiotic condition factors in only when you unseal these cages and you open up these cages relative to the challenges that lie beyond them. And what we found was that, uh, yes, the survivorship is due to uh, predaceous ants that um, uh, uh, co-occur with, with cassidine leaf beetles and they share uh, exact uh, geographical locations. And what you're seeing here is a predaceous astica ant, which is a generalist and very aggressive ant, recognizing that this beetle is without its defensive symbiont, pulling it out of the cage and uh, individually carrying it back to the ant nest. So it seems like we're describing a symbiosis that is defensive, uh, and it's an anti-predatory um, defensive alliance. But we wanted to also circle back to the phylogenetic position of the symbionts uh, as a potential plant pathogen. We wanted to ask whether the symbiont is living a dual lifestyle. And this was um, really helpful for us because we have the symbiont on plates. And very often when we think about host microbe interactions, we, we focus primarily on what the host is getting uh, and neglect whether there's a mutualistic role also for the symbionts. And what we wanted to test was whether uh, this Fusarium oxysporum retained the ability to be a mutualist or a pathogen of, of plants. And using pure cultures of uh, the symbionts, we inoculated the host plant of uh, uh, the beetle host, Ipomia batatas, the sweet potato plants, with Fusarium oxysporum and found that it induces a hallmark of Fusarium infection, which is yellow wilt disease. And you can see here through tripen blue staining, uh, that uh, necrotic lesions start spreading through the plants once it's uh, infected with fusarium. Then we asked whether the beetle is playing a role in propagating the symbiont to uninfected plants. Uh, and uh, the answer here is absolutely. The beetle is a vector for fusarium from one plant to the other. Uh, these plants are uninfected with uh, fusarium when the beetle is absent. The moment the beetle enters uh, the cage, uh, then the uh, symbiont is transferred from the beetle to the host plant. And so the beetle is also playing a vectoring role. But the question here is how? The symbiont is very conspicuous at the pupil level, but not so conspicuous at the adult stage. Where is the symbiont hanging out on the adult to facilitate that vectoring role? And what we uh, did here was quantify symbiont abundance uh, in the whole beetle uh, compared to its appendages, right? One of the first points of contact between a newly closed beetle is its feet, right? It's walking around onto a new uh, plant. And we wondered whether these appendages, and we define legs here as from the coxa all the way to the tarsal pads. And we found that legs and appendages are representative uh, of the um, symbiote population in the whole beetle. And a closer look at grumpy looking uh, cassidines and uh, zeroing in on their uh, feet, specifically their tars tarsal filaments, you find that uh, they're just filled with microbial aggregations, and these microbial aggregations are uh, Fusarium oxysporum. So then Eileen and Noah took a genomic approach towards understanding how this micro fluctuates between being a defensive insect symbiont and 
a plant pathogen. And what came back was a, um, a, a fungal genome that is relatively reduced. And so it's the second smallest Wisarium oxysporum genome. Uh, and given that reduction, we wondered whether uh, there were uh, features that were uh, striking relative to this pathogenicity angle versus the defensive angle. What we found was that the symbionts retained uh, its complete repertoire of plant cell wall degrading enzymes. Uh, it makes sense, right? Whether the beetle is there or not, you still need to be able to deconstruct cellulase or cellulose and pectin. But where there was variation were the effector molecules that are necessary for colonization. Uh, the symbiont lost a lot of genes uh, that are involved in, um, in mobility and in colonizing a host plant, which may reflect that it's relying on the beetle to chew its way in and then kind of creating a, uh, an opening for the, for the symbiont to proliferate. But what about the defensive function? Do, do we know anything about uh, how, what the symbiont encodes to fulfill that role for the beetle? And as a result, we collaborated with Nadine Zimmertz at the University of Tübingen uh, in characterizing the secondary metabolism of Fusarium oxysporum. And we found is that even though it went through reductive genome evolution, it's still an extremely potent microbe when it comes to the secondary metabolites that it could produce. And what we focused on are four classes of secondary metabolites that were very interesting to us. Uh, Bavarisin, Bicavarin, Fusaric acid, and gibberellic acid. These were interesting uh, compounds because they carry insecticidal elements in them. Uh, and uh, they are our current um, uh, testable uh, uh, compounds for whether uh, these insecticides uh, are differentially affecting ants relative to the beetle host. They're both insects. But we wonder whether there's uh, a greater tolerance in the cassidine leaf beetle to tolerate having a symbiont that is potentially insecticidal relative to how that symbiont affects other uh, animal classes and insect classes. And so with that, I'd like to, uh, hopefully I was able to convince you that cassidine leaf beetles are an interesting system to study symbioses. They have symbionts that allow them to, to deconstruct uh, complex plant poly polymers and that allows them to, to develop uh, and it close at normal rates. Uh, and two, that there is variation in what the symbiont introduces um, from a metabolic standpoint and that appears to correlate with the ecological range of the beetle. Next is that there is a high degree of, um, of calibration at the developmental level uh, in terms of the transmission of the symbiont as well as integration. This is a, so far these microbes that I've described are extracellular, uh, and yet you see a high degree of, of developmental um, um, regulation. And finally, uh, fungal symbionts are often neglected, but they play extremely important roles for, for their hosts. And so that's an avenue that my lab would like to, to expand into over the next few years. And so with that, I'd like to thank all the people that did the actual work. Uh, the group came into being two years ago. Um, I'd like to, to thank our collaborators that have been uh, really a pleasure to work with, starting with Don Windsor at the Smithsonian, Nicole Gerardo and Martin Kaltenkopf, who's been, who've been elemental building up the system uh, for us. Akima Fukatsu, Nadine Simmert, our collaborators in Japan and Tübingen, and funding sources from the Max Planck Society, uh, as well as the German Research Foundation. And I'm happy to take your questions if you have them. Do you have any questions? So it's a tremendous journey you've taken. Congratulations. I had two questions. I've almost forgotten them because you, you started talking about fungi and then I sort of replaced in my brain. Um, so the first question it was about the uh, story, the, the little uh, uh, which forms anticipating the arrival of the stammerer. So is that homologous to a, a, another organ in insects which are uh, not colonized? Um, we don't know yet the developmental origin of that symbiotic organ uh, in the sense that when we look at the transcriptome of um, uh, leaf beetles that are symbiotic versus apsymbiotic uh, state, um, uh, there is no signature tied to um, uh, genes that are uh, outwardly developmental. Uh, but we also see that this pouch, it forms in other leaf beetle clades that have pectinolytic symbioses. So it could be that there was a pre-adaptation, uh, so something that resembles a Malpighian tubule, especially when you consider the localization of these organs, that has been co-opted to house and maintain the symbiote. But the differentiation over time um, 
and repeatedly in different meat beetle groups, I think that's where the key is. And so we just need to do a better job at figuring out the range of pectinolytic symbioses that, that uh, exist in leaf beetles and look at when these organs form, are they conserved in both form, mm -hmm. and then ultimately what is the developmental basis of it. Yeah. I mean, if it was a vertebrate, you'd call it a salivary gland, but it's not, so you don't. Yeah. Um, so my second question related to the origin of the pectinases. And so in these, in these uh, uh, very ancient very, uh, varieties, I mean, they're not really ancient, but the ones which are evolutionarily most primitive, uh, you find on the most extreme one, you find actually the, the pectinase as an endogenous, as a genomic gene. And you assume therefore that the bacteria pick it up secondarily, but actually I don't think that's necessarily so. I mean, it, I was wondering what, you know, you, I don't know how much, how much sort of comparative protein evolutionary biology you can do to see whether, I mean, is it functionally a pectinase or is it homologous of pectinase? Well, and why didn't it travel in the other direction back then? Absolutely. Great question. So um, we look at the catalytics. First, we started by looking at the catalytic sites of these endogenous pectinases. And they're definitely functioning like pectinases. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd like to heterologously express them uh, in E. coli. So we've done that before with the symbiont encoding pectinases to confirm their function. We'd like to do that for these basal cacidines that but are- You identified the pectinase by homology initially, by a sequence on. Absolutely. Yeah. We always yeah. fall back on heterologous uh, expression to confirm the activity. And that's uh, um, uh, an, uh, an approach that we have functioning quite well in the lab. But the uh, 3D structure of an endogenous pectinase versus a symbiotic pectinase, they're different. Uh, and so AlphaFold tells us they're different. But we still need to go a little bit further in, in asking how does a variation at the 3D level actually affect the functionality of the pectinase? So it could very well be that they, uh, they're, they're both polygolecturinases, but they may vary in how, they, uh, how efficiently they deconstruct uh, pectin. And what I should also add is that these basal cassidines, they don't just have one copy of the polygolecturinase, they have four copies. And what the symbiont brings in is a single copy. And so one hypothesis that we have in the lab is that this enzyme may not be optimal under all, in any condition. It's just a jack of all trades of enzymes. And um, that may just be uh, enough when you consider the other enzymes that are coming in through symbiosis to make it adaptive compared to a non-symbiotic state. But I agree with you. It's a really tough sell, right? When you try to, to make the argument that you're outsourcing an important enzyme to a symbiont that is costly and may die out. Uh, through during transmission or doing other uh, kinks and in, in transmitting a microbe. I mean, there's a, re a reverse question would be whether there are free living bacteria which actually encode these pectinases. Uh, can you repeat that part again? Whether there are free living bacteria that encode pectinases that are homologous to these. Oh, um, our closest, so our blast searches reveal them to be consistently insect-associated pectinases. So uh, this horizontal gene, so uh, most herbivorous beetles encode pectinases endogenously through an ancient horizontal gene transfer event from fungi. Uh, and they kind of form a monophyletic cluster. And so we're not worried at all whether this is uh, a contaminant. Uh, so uh, it's embedded next to other insect-associated genes. I don't know if that's where you were going with your question. Yeah, so because, uh, because I've worked with the Irenias and Pectobacterium, and they they have pectinases, right? And then, but they are not um, in sequence wise. They are not homologous to these ones. Is that what you're saying? Um, so they uh, so the symbiotic pectinases they uh, are monophyletic, but it doesn't mean that they have a common origin all the time. Uh, it could just be a kink of this AT uh, bias that many uh, symbiont genomes have, and as a result, uh, it affects their amino acid composition in ways that may be a little bit artificial. Uh, but we also know that uh, these uh, pectinases, they're closer to free living pectinases relative to beetle encoded pectinases. And so there's this kind of this gradient when you look at this uh, a phylogenetic tree of um, GH28. They're closely related to the free living. To the free living. Mm -hmm. And I should also add that these pectinases and xylanases uh, that are uh, symbiotically encoded, they don't sit on the chromosome of the symbiont, they sit on the plasmid. And so it's very likely that this plasmid was acquired from a free living uh, um, endophyte or a plant pathogen yeah. uh, by the symbiont initially that kind of facilitated uh, the origin and then evolutionary stability of the symbiosis over 80 million years. Mm -hmm. and, and so 
how, how many do you know how many cells do you typically have of the of the symbiont in, of the stemmer symbiont you have in the beetles? So at the adult stage, uh, there are about 2.8 million cells in the foregut symbiotic organ. And then there's a severe bottleneck that the symbiont goes through. The first is during transmission. So it goes from 2.8 million to um, a couple of hundred thousand uh, symbiont cells within the caplets. And then there's another population bottleneck that the symbiont goes through during metamorphosis. When the reorganization of all the internal organs are happening, we find that the symbiont titers dropped as uh, few as 400 cells. Uh, and so that's just a, a just a very very drastic population model like this that the symbiont goes through every generation. Mm -hmm. And so again, in these uh, plant pathogens that have the pectinases, uh, they um, tightly regulate this by chloron sensing, and and so they only activate the production of these enzymes at very high cell density, presumably uh, because it's not productive to produce it at when there are very few cells that they're not going to be sufficient to degrade the the plant cell wall. Um, so I would imagine that the, the bacteria symbiont needs to be relying on, on the host uh, um, nutrients for achieving like higher cell density. And if you, if you said about this. A hundred percent. And uh, not just that. So definitely there's investments on the hosts to allow Stamara to proliferate at high rates very quickly when it's needed. Uh, but there's also uh, transcriptional plasticity at the symbiont level. We find that Stamara recognizes based on the resources around it, uh, whether it's in a foregut organ or in a caplet. And when it's in the foregut symbiotic organ where it's necessary for it to produce pectinases, it upregulates the expression of uh, pectinase encoding genes compared to if it's sitting in the egg where it's just there and needs to, to be metabolically inactive during transmission. There we find that pectinases are downregulated. <laughs> Sorry, so, so there's a question uh, in the chat there online. Please read it. It's a bottom one. Oh. Okay, it's from uh, Nicholas Schroeder. Uh, and in, he says, uh, which genes did the Stammerer genome retain compared to similarly degraded genomes of intracellular symbionts? Are there candidates you believe to be essential to the extracellular lifestyle? Uh, great question, Nicholas. And uh, hi from Okinawa. So uh, I would say that one of the uh, aspects that jump out are the, um, is that fermentation pathway. So that obligate fermentation pathway that we think is quite different from many intracellular symbionts. And we think that Stamara could get away with an, um, an obligate fermentation pathway because it's an extracellular microbe. So as it exports lactate, which is a product of obligate fermentation, it can build up in a, in a symbiotic organ uh, in a matrix without being toxic as opposed to building up in a, in a bacteria site, which is a host cell. So I, I have a, there's another question. Yes, there's another question. All right, uh, this is from Ava. Hi, um, so the question is, the 12 spheres, the potential overinvestments in the symbiont transmission, are they all identical? Does each of them contain a clonal symbiont population? And is there any diversity in the plant cell degrading enzymes within a caplet population? Is it possible that there is some diversity there for the beetle to choose from? Uh, so we'll start one at a time. Uh, are they all identical? It's a, uh, really hard for us to define at this uh, level. Uh, we don't know if they're exactly the same size all the time, but we know that they're uh, there in similar numbers. Um, and they definitely contain a clonal symbiont population because when we look at the transcriptome of these caplets, 99% of the reads are stamera. So uh, it's not cross-contaminated with another microbe or uh, a host uh, cell, for example. Uh, and uh, we think that the diversity is pretty low in the system. So the, the beetle may not have to make choices. It could be that it's uh, it just kind of uh, streamlines how many microbes are in the system. I have a question about the fusarium. So at the end, the beetle is infesting the plants. It's going to have the next generation growing on with, with, a fungi, with a fungus, right? So is there any competition between the beetle and the fungus at that stage? Or is, there an, or is the beetle actually eating up also the fungus? Yeah, thanks. So uh, we think that it's a synergistic interaction. So typically when uh, pathogens uh, end or are... Um, infecting a plant or herbivores are, are, are feeding on a plant, you either have one of two pathways taking uh, responding on the plant side, either the gismonic acid pathway 
or the uh, psilocybic acid pathway. One is optimized towards defending a plant from an herbivore, the other against a pathogen. Uh, and what's interesting about these two pathways is that they're binary. You could never have them turned on at the same time. So it could be that this beetle gets away uh, by going undetected uh, by its host plant by releasing the symbiont first uh, and effectively uh, sneaking in uh, behind the symbiont. But we don't know yet uh, who comes first. <laughs> is it the is the path is the symbiont in the system first before the beetle gets there, or uh, does the beetle propagate it every single time? And the reason why we're not sure is because we think that this uh, Poserium oxysporum is bimodally uh, transmitted. We think it's transmitted vertically through the beetle to the plants and horizontally. Sorry, it's transmitted vertically from one generation of the beetle to the next, but also acquired horizontally from the plants every generation. Any more questions? No? Okay, thank you very much. All right, thanks.